I found so much freedom and so much rest and so much peace from what we're going to talk about today that I pray it's just as meaningful to you. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, but when the time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. I want to focus on that phrase in verse 7 and teach for the next few minutes on the subject, no longer slaves. You are not a slave, you are a son. You are not a slave, you are a daughter of God. I want you to give me a little grace today because the next few minutes, the first part, may seem more like a counseling session than a sermon, but my goal is to lay a foundation and show you how our distorted concept of ourselves And our dysfunction in human relationships are merely a reflection of our wrong perception of God and our misunderstanding of the gospel. If we can get our hearts and our heads around the gospel, it will change everything. It will change the way we relate to God, it will change the way we relate to ourselves, and it will change the way we relate to others. I lean far more to the prophet preacher side than I do the counselor or Dr. Phil type. But let me lay a psychological foundation in the beginning that exposes our misunderstanding of the gospel. Because if we can change the way we think about God and ourselves and bring that into alignment with God's word, it will change everything else in our lives. When you go back to the beginning of your Bible, you see in the very first passages of Genesis, the very first chapters of Genesis, that God created us, the human race, with a healthy need for relationship. God told Adam in chapter 2, it is not good that man be alone. So get this, our need for relationship is a healthy need. It is a perfect need. It is a God-designed need. This relational need was a part of human existence before sin ever came into the world. But in Genesis 3, sin perverted our relationship need. What was healthy, sin has made unhealthy. So now, instead of us finding our self-worth and being measured by our relationship with God, we measure ourselves by the way other people view us. Now we let our value, our worth, and our identity be determined through the lenses of our relationships, the way other people see us. And you can see how this creates all kinds of dysfunction in our lives. If our self-worth comes from the approval of other people, and people that perform well tend to be approved of, then that fuels our unhealthy drive for performance and approval. Here's the unhealthy equation that most of us live by. Approval of others plus my performance equals my self-worth or my self-image or my identity. And just to show you what I mean and be honest for a minute, if you have 20 close and meaningful relationships in your life and 19 of those people approve of you, but one of them doesn't, which one of those 20 consumes your thoughts and your emotions? The one that doesn't. Because all of us in one way or another are living by this equation. The approval of others plus my performance equals my self-worth, my self-image, or my identity. And here's what happens when you live your life by this formula, and most of us do until we understand the gospel. And if we don't stay in the gospel, we revert back to this formula. Here's what this formula produces in us. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of punishment, and shame. These four things are the byproduct of living our lives by performing to gain approval and letting other people's opinions determine our self-worth. This equation feeds us lies that end up governing our lives. And for every one of those lies, the gospel gives us an answer. Now, I want to walk through four of those lies quickly And then spend the rest of our time focusing on God's rebuttal to those lies. His answer to those lies found in the gospel. All right, Here's lie number one. We're just going to go through these quickly. Lie number one. I must meet certain standards and measure up to have value and worth. 
Believing this lie leads you to the performance trap. It creates a fear of failure and an unhealthy drive for perfectionism that often leads to the manipulation of others for the sake of success. God's answer to this lie is something called justification. And we're going to talk about that. Lie number two, others must approve of me to validate my value and worth. This lie turns you into an approval addict. It leads to an unhealthy desire to please people at any cost, which is driven by a fear of rejection. This person is over, often overly sensitive to criticism and withdraws from others to avoid their disapproval. God's response to this lie is something called reconciliation. We'll talk about that. Lie number three, people who fail, including myself, so we see ourselves this way, other people and ourselves who fail are less valuable and less lovable. This lie creates a fear of punishment that leads to blame, which causes people to withdraw from God and others in an attempt to avoid failure. God's response to this lie is something called propitiation. Lie number four, I am what I am. I cannot change. This lie leads to hopelessness, shame, inferiority, and isolation. And God's response to this lie is something called regeneration. These lies govern us when we don't understand the gospel. They negatively shape our self-worth, the way we perceive God, and then the way we relate to everybody else. And God's response to all of those lies are rich theological truths that are anchored in his character that are expressed in the gospel. Again, if we can get our heads and our hearts around these truths, it will change everything for us. Let's look at them. Number one, justification. Justification is a legal term that simply means to be made righteous. Think of it this way. This is how I I learned justification in seminary. Justification, justified, is just as if I'd never sinned. So justified, just as if I'd never sinned. It means to be made righteous. And Paul addresses this in Romans 5 when he writes, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight, that's a key phrase, that means to be justified. We've been made right in God's sight by faith. We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. To be made right in God's sight is translated justified. We have been made righteous. We have been justified by our faith in Christ. So now we are righteous in the sight of God. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. That's justification. When the righteousness of Christ belongs to us, then we are now justified. That's justification, all right? But get this, justification does not mean innocence. We are not innocent. We are guilty. Justification simply means someone with authority has paid the penalty for our guilt, for our wrongdoing. We are all very guilty. We are not innocent. But grace has justified us and made us righteous in Christ. Now think of it this way. Let's let's imagine I have two ledgers up here. One ledger has your name on it, and the ledger is full of every sin you've ever committed. All your guilt, all your wrong is in that ledger. On the other ledger up here, I have one that has Christ's name on it, and all the marks of the righteousness of Christ are in his ledger. So when you read 2 Corinthians 5.21, what God is saying, what Paul is saying there in that moment, is God has taken all of the sin in our ledger, and he has charged it to Christ's ledger, He has taken all of the righteousness of Christ's ledger and he has credited it to our account. So now when God sees us, he no longer sees our sin. They are lost in Christ. He sees the righteousness of Christ because we have literally become the righteousness of God. That is justification. So when you put your faith in Christ, you are justified by your faith and you are made right in the eyes of God. So here's the big question. How righteous are you? Now, notice I didn't ask you, how righteous do you act? I said, how righteous are you? Because if you have put your faith in Christ, the righteousness of Christ is something you become. It is who you are. Pay attention to Paul's letters in the New Testament. He says it in a lot of places, but especially to the Corinthians. Over and over again, I'm going to paraphrase, but Paul says something like this over and over again in the Corinthian letters, a lot of his letters, but especially to the Galatians, but especially to the Corinthians. He said, you holy, righteous saints, why are you doing these stupid things and living immoral lives? He says it over and over again. 
differentiating between who they are and what they are doing. Notice this, their actions do not define their identity. He's referring to these incredible things they have become in Christ, holy, righteous saints, but he calls them out for their sinful actions. Their actions are not defining their identity. The gospel has defined their identity. You are this, holy, righteous saints, and because of that, these actions are beneath you, he says. You see, sin is not what we are. It is not our identity. Paul is differentiating between our identity and our actions. But because a lot of us don't fully understand the gospel, some of us let our sin become our identity. And the Bible says that whatever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you think sin is your permanent identity, you're going to keep living like a slave instead of a son. Once you come to Jesus Christ, you are no longer a slave to sin. You have become the righteousness of Christ. Listen, you need to grasp the truth of justification and start seeing and thinking of yourself as a son or daughter of God, not as a slave to sin. Even on your bad days when you don't measure up, you are still the righteousness of Christ and the actions in your life don't define who you are. The gospel defines who you are. Here's God's second answer to the lies. Reconciliation. God created you with a need for acceptance, but he also created you in such a way that the only acceptance that will meet your need is his acceptance. And if you don't find acceptance in him, you're going to search aimlessly your entire life looking for something that you'll never lay hold of. You'll never find acceptance if you don't find it in Christ. Through Christ, God has taken us from a place of alienation and separation, from a place of being unacceptable and has made us acceptable. God reconciled us to himself, not based on our performance, but based on what Christ has done. This is the way Paul said it to the Colossians chapter 1 verse 21. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions, yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Now, some church people need to lean into verse 23. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you have received when you heard the good news. You see, God never accepts the unacceptable. So in order to be in relationship with us, he had to make us acceptable. And our acceptance in the eyes of God is not based on how well we perform or how we live up to the standard or the opinions of other people. Some of us have the Ten Commandments on our refrigerator door. Or they're framed and hung somewhere in our house. But you do realize there are more than ten, right? The New Testament gives 1,050 commandments to the Christian. So if you're saying, you know what, I don't want to rely on Christ to have acceptance before God. I don't, I don't want to rely on Christ to get God's approval. Then all you have to do is keep all 1,050 of those commandments consistently 100% of the time. But if you don't, which none of us do, you will never be pleasing or acceptable to God. Or you can believe the good news of the gospel and rely on Christ's work, what he has done on your behalf. God's third answer to the lies, propitiation. Now that's a word we don't use often. It's the least familiar word that we're going to talk about today. But propitiation simply means the wrath of someone that has been unjustly wronged has now been satisfied. The wrath of someone that has been unjustly wronged has now been satisfied. And here's what that looks like in Scripture. A holy God cannot overlook sin. And because all of us have sinned and all of us are separated from God, we are all deserving of his righteous wrath. Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. But Paul explains how Christ has become the propitiation for our sins, satisfying the wrath of God. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Christ has satisfied the wrath of God against sin on our behalf. And there was only one reason Jesus was willing to subject himself to that, to the cross, to the punishment, to the shame on your behalf, because he loves you. Infinitely, eternally, irrevocably, he loves you. Propitiation screams to us of the depth of God's love for us. We no longer have to hold our heads in shame or walk in fear of punishment before our sin because Christ has satisfied the wrath of God on our behalf. That's propitiation. God's fourth answer to the lies, regeneration. In order to overcome inferiority and shame, you have to understand how completely God wants to change you. He wants to transform you from the inside out and free you from your past. Regeneration is the act of God's grace making us someone completely new and different, giving us a new identity and making us literally, to use biblical language, a brand new creation, which is why people who come to faith in Christ often refer to their salvation moment as being born again. That is regeneration language. There's probably no story in the Bible that illustrates this better than the story of Zacchaeus in Luke 19. He was a wealthy tax collector, a Jew, who had now been employed by the Roman Empire to extort money from his own people, the Jews, in order to fund Rome. So tax collectors were despised and hated because they were viewed as traitors and swindlers. One day, Zacchaeus learns that Jesus was visiting his hometown. In order to get a glimpse of him, Zacchaeus climbs up in a sycamore tree to look at a man that supposedly loved sinners and outcasts like he was. Jesus sees Zacchaeus in the tree, and to the shock of the crowd and to Zacchaeus, he invites him down from the tree, and then Jesus invites himself into Zacchaeus' home. At dinner, Zacchaeus experiences the unconditional love and acceptance of Christ, and it changes him. He becomes a different person. His identity was radically altered from a swindling, loathsome tax collector to a person who now knew he was completely loved by God. And his actions reflected that change. He pledged to repent of his sins. He pledged to repay all that he has swindled four times over. And he promised to give half of his possessions to the poor. So through Christ, Zacchaeus had now developed a new identity, a new set of values, new goals, and new behavior. You see, regeneration is not a self-help program. Regeneration is not a cleanup campaign for our sinful nature. Regeneration is nothing less than the supernatural impartation of new life. Paul writes about regeneration in his letter to Titus. He says this, Titus 3, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves, to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, I'm going through all of this, and it makes religious church people nervous, and a lot of other people don't understand, and somebody is bound to be thinking inside, asking this question. All right, pastor, if God doesn't accept me, based on my performance, but through what Christ has done, then why would I even obey at all? Why would I perform at all? Why would I even attempt to live a holy life if it's not about me, it's all about what Christ has done? Well, I wanna answer that by giving you healthy reasons to walk in obedience to God, healthy motivations to honor him. But there are a lot of unhealthy reasons that people obey God. A lot of reasons church people every day obey God for inadequate and unhealthy reasons that make us slaves instead of sons and daughters. So before I get to the healthy reasons, let me quickly walk through some of the unhealthy. And I call them inadequate motivations because if if your motivation for obeying God 
is one of the ones I'm about to mention, they will never keep you walking in obedience. That's why they are inadequate. Here's number one, unhealthy, inadequate reason for obedience. Someone will find out. This is compliance based on fear. Some of us actually perform really well because we're afraid somebody else will find out if we don't. So the fear of being exposed becomes our motivation for living a good life. But here's the problem. If the fear of someone finding out is your motivation for obedience, one day we're going to come to a place where our care about is less than our want to. And our desire for whatever we want is going to become greater than our fear of being exposed. This is how people that have appeared to have lived their whole lives well kept, together, performing well, being obedient, moral, and then all of a sudden they commit some drastic, tragic, devastating sin that goes public. Because when you've lived your whole life with the opinions of other people as your motivation for obedience, there is going to come a day when your desire for it, whatever it is, is greater than the concerns of other people in your life. Someone finding out is never an adequate reason to walk in obedience. Number two, God will hate me. Do you realize that in our country, there are far more people that used to go to church that now don't than the number of people that actually attend church? So there are far more church dropouts in America today than there are current church attendees. Why is that? Now, we could talk about a lot of reasons today, but one of the main reasons is because a lot of these people tried, they tried church, and they left feeling that this is not a game they could win. There are so many rules that they just don't think they'll ever be able to measure up, and they got enough other junk going on in their lives that they don't want to come to church every week and be reminded of how miserably they are failing God. They think God hates them, so they just stay away. But that fear of rejection, because they don't measure up, which leads to their withdrawing, comes from a misunderstanding of the gospel. When you understand the gospel, when you realize that God's wrath for sin was satisfied through Christ on the cross, as Isaiah 53 says, our punishment was placed upon him. When you realize that, you quit being afraid of God, you quit trying to run from God, and you start running to him. Religion reveals an angry God that hates you. The gospel reveals a loving father that language and words are inadequate to express the depth of his love. The third inadequate or unhealthy reason for your obeying or your obedience, image management, which is basically driven by pride, image management or pride. I mean, people love to appear righteous. I mean, they love to look righteous. I mean, I mean, we've got stickers on our car and fish, and like some of y'all drive, you need to get the fish off your car the way you drive. Get all the fish off. Don't put a North Place sticker on your car the way you get it all off. Don't shame the name. But we, we love to appear righteous, and we're often pious and devoted because our religious devotion makes us feel better about ourselves, which is why there is so much hypocrisy and condescension in the church, because people who act moral for all the wrong reasons have worked hard for their morality. They have worked hard for their goodness, and they tend to look down their noses in condescension at everybody in their life that they don't think are working as hard as they are. It's inadequate because it's pride. And God stands against pride in every form. And this religious pride stinks more to God than many of the public sins these people are always ranting against. The fourth inadequate reason for obeying, I'll make a trade with God. A lot of people think God trades marbles, that he's open to a swap. Like this is what it sounds like in a prayer life. Okay, God, I'm going to obey, I'm going to perform well, I'm going to be devoted, but this is what I expect in return. I'm going to go to church, I'm going to pay my tithe, I'm going to help the missionary, I'll go to the homeless shelter, I'll serve the poor, I'll volunteer, but keep sickness and suffering away from my house. Let all go well with me. But when your obedience to God is a trade, and then suffering does come into your life, you get disillusioned. 
because you think that your obedience was making deposits into your God account and now you need to make withdrawals and God isn't working the miracle. He's not opening the door. He's not healing the sickness. You think that God is now not living up to his end of the deal. But here's the problem. God never agreed to that deal. He doesn't trade marbles. He doesn't make deals. He believes that we should respond to him and obey simply because of who he is, not for what we can get out of him. Those are the wrong reasons to obey. So let me quickly give you the right ones. The healthy motivations for obedience that will actually keep you walking in obedience to God as a son and daughter, not as a slave. Okay? An awareness that sin is destructive. God is the author and the creator of life. And he knows more than anybody else what is going to be destructive to his creation. So he doesn't establish all these boundaries and give us all of these commands because he's a cosmic killjoy. It's because he knows what destroys the life he created. The creator knows what damages his creation. So his commands are given to us to protect us because he loves us and he knows that sin is destructive. And when you know that, it will help you walk in obedience to his commands. Another healthy motivation, the reality of God's discipline. When God convicts you of sin in your life, it is never to punish you, but to express his love for you. His discipline is always redemptive, never punitive. Hebrews 12, 6, for the Lord disciplines those he loves. Look, I felt really important to lean into this. I felt led to do this today. And so I need you to listen carefully. Lean into me. If you're living a life of marked rebellion against God right now, and as I often say, you're running 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction, and you don't feel his chastening, you don't feel his correction, you don't feel his discipline, you have a massive problem. Because it may mean you are not his child. Someone that is in relationship with God is going to feel a sense of loving correction when they step into sin. And when you feel it, just know it's an expression of God's love. His goodness and mercy is trying to bring you back from the brink of destruction. But if you're living in sin and you don't feel his discipline, you are in an incredibly dangerous spiritual place. A third healthy motivation for obedience because his commands are good. When God says, don't do this and avoid that, he's trying to keep us from the destruction of sin. But when God says, I want you to do this, he is trying to place you in the pathway of a blessing. When God asks something from us, his commands are always an attempt to position us for blessing. His instruction is good. His leading and guidance is good. His commands are good. His motivation and intentions toward you are good. That's why the psalmist said, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, take joy. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. And fourth, motivation for walking in obedience, honoring God, the love of Christ compels us. Let me confess a tragic reality I experienced in my early walk with God. It's, I suffered from it for years, and it's still tragic because there's a lot of you listening to me today that are suffering for the same thing today that I suffered early in my walk with Christ. Still a tragedy. For years after I came to Christ, I never fully experienced Christ's love. I felt his forgiveness. I believed his promise that I would go to heaven when I died, but I didn't really know what it was like for God to love me unconditionally as his son. My head told me that God's love was unconditional. But the religious environment around me and my own dysfunction convinced me that it could not be true. The sermons that I heard, the stuff I was involved in made me feel like God's love was conditional and it was all based on my performance. And because I kept failing in my performance... I always saw God as angry with me and disappointed in me. And I, I kept living this cycle of striving to please and failing and God being angry and me withdrawing because you can't be intimate with what you're afraid of. And there was this distance in my relation. I never had rest. I never felt the love and acceptance of God. Some of y'all grew up in churches that taught eternal security. I grew up in a church that taught eternal 
eternal insecurity. My relationship with God, they'd have never called it that, but my relationship with God was hanging by a thread and it was all based on my ability to keep the rules and measure up. And it turned me into a slave instead of a son. When I finally saw God of the Bible, the God of the Bible for who he is, a gracious, loving father instead of an angry, punishing deity, I finally was able to rest in his unconditional love and acceptance. And for the first time in my life, I was already preaching. And for the first time in my life, I felt like I had a father who loved me like a son instead of being yoked in chains as a religious slave. Let me leave you with this. I want to show you something that helped me change the way I looked at God from angry to loving, taking pleasure in me. And I hope it helps you. A lot of things help change my theology and then my psychology, the way I see myself, the way I relate to others, the way I relate to God. This is one of them. The Bible says God is love. I mean, 1 John 4, 8. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So his, his, his personhood is the embodiment of love. He is love. So with that in mind, think about that 1 Corinthians 13 passage. Remember where Paul writes, love is patient, love is kind, love is all these things. All right, if God is love, to help you see him for who he is, let's do something for a minute. Let's read my father in 1 Corinthians 13. My father is instead of love is. Okay? My father is very patient and kind. My father is not envious, never boastful. My father is not arrogant. My father is never rude, nor is he self-seeking. My father is not quick to take offense. My father does not gloat over my sins, but always glad when the truth prevails. My father knows no limit to his endurance, no end to his trust. My father is always hopeful and patient. You see, your perception of God and your understanding of the love and acceptance of God found in the gospel will determine the way you think and the way you approach life. It will determine everything from the way you relate to yourself, the way you relate to God, and the way you relate to everybody else. If you can find new identity in Christ, self-worth and value in Christ, loved and accepted, you will have a new confidence, a new assurance as a son or daughter of God instead of living as a religious slave. So let me challenge you. I'm going to give you a declaration today. Um, and I challenge you that taking notes is going to be tough today, but if you're going to write anything down or take any picture, get this one, okay, of the screen. Get this one because I, I want you to walk out of here today in the next few days saying this over your life, okay, a declaration. And this declaration stands in the face of all of the lies we talked about, and it embraces all of the truth of the gospel in one declaration, okay? Boils it down to five statements. Here they go. I am deeply loved. I am completely forgiven. I am fully pleasing. I am totally accepted by God. I am absolutely complete in Christ. And some of you are saying, I can't be. Well, you can be because it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with him. And you rest in him as his son or daughter. Okay? I am deeply loved. I am completely forgiven. I am fully pleasing. I am totally accepted by God and I am absolutely complete in Christ. And here's how this frees you. When you're coming from the striving as a slave, you never get out of the cycle. But when you come from a place of assurance as a son or a daughter, then you want to live. Your, mo your motivations for doing right change. You, you don't do right out of obligation. You do right to honor the name of your father. It's an expression of love and worship. Let me offer you a resource today. I, I brought mine with me. I read this book many, many years ago. I went back and read it in the last few weeks. The Search for Significance. This is actually a copy that has the workbook included in it. It could be personal devotion for you. Um, it could be a several week Bible study in a small group, but it goes much deeper, but addresses the same things that I'm talking about, changed my life. Billy Graham said this is one of the most important books ever written outside the Bible. Billy Graham said this was written in the 80s, multiple reprints. He said, every Christian ought to read this book. If you've read it in the past, go back and read it again. If you've never read it, I believe it'll change your life and it'll take you deeper into what we're talking about today. All across our campuses, I'm going to ask you to stand. Here in Sac, C, Wiley, Garland, 
Would you stand with me today there in the Hughes unit? Please stand. Here's what I'm going to do. We're going to sing a song today we're familiar with. It's going to be more of a song on the way out rather than a moment in the service. But it simply says, I am no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. We're going to sing it live at every campus, but I want the prayer team here in Saxe, the prayer teams in Wiley and Garland, if you would make yourself available to serve the people. I want to speak a blessing over your life today. But before I do that, let me just say this. These these prayer teams are available to you to pray over any need that you have in your life. But I would fail you as a preacher of the gospel if I didn't give somebody a chance today to surrender their life to Christ. You have heard the gospel today in its purest form. And if religion has driven you away from God, don't blame God for religion. You've heard the gospel today. A loving father that wants you to be justified, regenerated, God's wrath satisfied on your behalf, reconciled into relationship with God. And it's not about you. It's about what he has done for you. Put your faith in him today. May you be in church your whole life, but it never clicked. You never understood the gospel. Today is the day to be lost, let him take everything on your ledger, charge it to Christ's account, and all the righteousness of Christ, let it be transferred to your account. It'll change you when you start living that way and thinking of yourself as a son or daughter of God instead of a religious slave. So when we come forward for prayer today, and today you wanna step across the line of faith, there's no better time than the present to get lost in the righteousness of Christ. Father, will you bless them and keep them? Will you make your face shine down upon them? Will you be gracious to them? Turn your countenance their direction and grant them peace. In Jesus' name.